Amen. Thank you, Brother Don. So, our, uh, our sermon today, our discussion today, is entitled in your bulletin, Radical Happiness. Awesome. Right? We all love that thought. And we are continuing in our uh, E100 series that Pastor Marcus started earlier in the year, The Greatest 100 Stories of the Bible. And this is one directly from the words of Jesus. Matthew has about uh, five great sermons or discourses of Jesus that he has recorded in the book of Matthew. And this is, I believe, the first one. And we often title it the Sermon on the Mount. Luke portrays another one called the Sermon on the Plains. And whether they're the same one or not, they have a lot of similarities. And what it is, Jesus has been accumulating a great crowd of followers, right? He has his disciples, and in this case, it's labeled his disciples following. It doesn't necessarily mean the 12, I'm not sure, but those that are following him, those that are believing in some of his teachings and wanting to get to know him better. And this one is titled, The Beatitudes. Okay, and it's very, many of you know it, um, if you've been, quote unquote, churched, or if you studied the word before, but to others, Beatitude is a very foreign word. I even looked it up in the dictionary, and one dictionary didn't even have that word, right? It's not something we use in common English. I did find it in another place, but it's there. And so the context of, of happiness, which can be derived from the Beatitudes, the blessings, to be happy. And we're going to talk about not just what it is to be happy or what we do with our happiness, but... How do we carry forth that since we have been given? Or have we had that opportunity to be blessed and to be happy? Okay? So I would ask today really is, I mean, how many of you are happy in here? Or pants. How many of you are happy? Okay. How many of you are unhappy? It's okay. There are a lot of things in this world to be very unhappy about, right? It doesn't mean we get held down in unhappiness and sadness. All the time, because I pray and I hope that if you know the Lord or if there's other reasons that we have joy and we have happiness in our heart at all times that can kind of overcome those brief setbacks. Right. But happiness is something I will guarantee we all seek it all the time. It consumes us. It drives us. Whatever actions you do, it's all about seeking happiness for yourself. Admit it. Okay? Or it's about seeking happiness for someone else, which is a great thing as well. And so that, I, I, I know, should capture your attention that you want to be happy. And I can see it on some of your faces. You are happy. And there was a lot of chat out there this morning. It's happy. And as I watch some families come in here today and other expressions, it brings me great happiness to be here. It brought me a lot of great happiness and joy just to study um, the context of what the Lord has in store for us today um, in saying this as well. But um, there are some things that are certain in life. One of those is what? what? What's certain in life? What's that quote we say about there's two things that are certain in life? Death and taxes, Death and taxes right? <laughs> yes, that could be true, but not entirely. Death is certain. Taxes not all people in the world pay taxes, okay? If I don't make money or I don't spend money, I don't pay taxes. Or even in some foreign lands, taxes of foreign objects, right? But there is something for certain. I guarantee we are all pursuing happiness. And then the other part is still true. We're all going to die, okay? So in the midst of that thought process, what is it that can truly get us happiness? And, and how do we... Pursue it. There's every action we take. What do we do? What do we eat? What do we wear? You know, that stuff is all about what is making us happy. I even found in context of, of happiness, it's on the other side, family feud. My children have been playing this game here a little bit lately. And it says, name something people do when they're happy. All right? Think about that for you. What do you do? When you're happy. Okay. What are those real expressions? And so the survey, right? This is right. Because it's been a big time survey says. Number one, smile. Awesome. Great. That's what my daughter said the other day when I asked her what happiness was too. 
Two, we laugh. We sing. Amen. We've already done that in his house this morning. We'll do some more. We whistle. Cry. The beatitude speaks of that. It speaks of mourning, right? We cry tears of joy or expressions of joy. We jump up and down. Right? Dance, you might say, per, per se. Okay? I've seen some of that in here this morning as well as we did it. But as we get into Matthew chapter 5 a little bit, we're going to not just talk about the great thing of happiness. And I'm not going to bring you the Joel Osteen gospel of happiness and just smiling, right? It'll get you through today's world. But we're going to see what can we take away from this today that is life changing, that is more than just happiness, that is a condition of, of our soul and our daily life and our daily walk in this world. And so we all define happiness in a lot of different ways. It's like Family Feud did here as far as the world's context. But I know it's all something we, we do desire. And so what is it that makes you happy? What is it that you're happy about? The psalmist says, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. I hope that's the condition of our happiness in this place today. We all want to be happy. And I think if we can all get on that same page... Um, that we can be there. But what exactly is happiness and where is it? Where do you find it? There's a popular, I should popular, but there's a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness. Right? Have, have many of you have probably seen it. Will Smith is the main character. Um, Christopher is, is the, the, it's based on a true story. This is Christopher. And I've got a little video here, and there's a lot of great, great clips and lines in this movie. But the pursuit of happiness. Rich, do you have that queued up real quick? Just a quick, but when you're able, play this and, and observe what's going on in here. Somebody is pursuing happiness. Come. Today, um, you know, being the last day and all. Well, thank you, thank you. We appreciate that. But um, wear one tomorrow, though, okay? Because tomorrow is going to be your first day. If you'd like to work here as a broker, would you like that, Chris? Yes, sir. Good. We couldn't be happier. As easy as it looked? No, sir. No, no, sir, it wasn't. Good luck, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, if you've seen the movie before, you also know some things that occur before this condition of happiness, right? Christopher Gardner basically has lost everything in life. He has given up so much to pursue what he thinks is going to be happiness. And he finds some, right? And, and I would say that this isn't just a worldly context of happiness because we don't, they never tell him what his salary is, right? I mean, that's what the world's they seeking after is, is money, wages, success, acclaim, accolades. There's, there's a couple good lessons in this movie for sure. But if you realize what Christopher goes through to get to this point of being hired by this great investment firm, it is a struggle. I mean, he, he, loses, he loses his wife. He almost lost his child. He loses his house, then an apartment, then a hotel room, then a men's halfway house, then a train station. These are all places he had slept or tried to sleep. He barely holds on to his son, little Chris. And it's all for the pursuit of what he thought was going to be success and a better wages, a better living. Not bad things to seek after, but it does consume him in this movie and it can consume us as well. So there's a lot of phenomenal lines in that movie. One of them I remember is little Chris. He, they, they try to add some lightheartedness to it because it is such a deep and intense movie. And, and little Chris, they joke around each other a little bit and Chris says, Dad, you want to hear something funny? Sure. He goes, Dad, there was this guy that was drowning. And he was crying out for help, help. And a boat comes along and says, do you need help? And the man says, no, God will save me. Okay. He's still drowning. And a second boat comes along and says, can I help you? He says, no, God will save me. And the man ends up drowning he gets to heaven and he asks God, why didn't you save me? I did, you dummy. I sent two boats. <laughs> Sorry for the distraction, but that's also from, from the movie there. So, so happiness, where do we find it? Let me first say, say that, uh, where do you not find it? You don't find it in the world, right? True happiness. And that's why it's called a pursuit, right? Christopher even makes... Reference, he's staring off into the abyss. He's so tired so many times because he doesn't sleep. He's studying for this job uh, that he wants to get and, and, and so many other challenges. But he's staring off and he starts reflecting on Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. Right? Even happiness is written into our Declaration of Independence in this country. It says we have the inalienable right to pursue life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness, right? We have that right. We're supposed to go after it. But he says, you know, they were right. Why is it called a pursuit? Because can you ever really get to it, he says. He's starting to get lost, right? He's being downtrodden in, in this fact. And it is. It's a pursuit. We have to keep going after it, my friends. There's a lot of ways that we do that. And in the Bible today, we're going to look at the things that God tells us to pursue that are sources of happiness, that are blessings. But there's a lot of things in the world that it's not. It's not money, because money can't buy you happiness. It can't buy you a lot of things. I made myself a little, just started running through my brain. The things that money can't buy, let me read this to you. I, it can buy you a nice big house but it can't make it a home. It can buy you a haircut, but not good looks. It can buy you books, but it can't buy you brains. It can buy you a college tuition, but it can't buy you intuition, right? It can buy you pills and doctors, but it's not going to buy you health. It can buy you sunglasses, but it can't buy you the sun or the sun, right? It can buy you a gun, but it can't buy you safety. It can buy you amusement, but it cannot buy you happiness. It can buy you into a relationship, but as the song says, money can't buy you love, right? It can buy you a wedding ring, but it cannot buy you a lasting relationship. It can provide you coins for the offering plate, but it can't buy you salvation. It can buy you a nice engraved tombstone, 
but it can't buy your way into heaven, right? Money cannot buy you all things, even though that's the fact that uh, the world is seeking after. There's only one place you can find happiness, and that's in God. God is the true source of happiness and strength, of hope and wisdom. Those who favor his, uh, his ways will always have all those things. So let's take a look at what God says through the words of Jesus here about being happy in one of the greatest sermons I think ever given by Jesus, by God incarnate himself. We we'll begin in chapter 5 of Matthew with the Beatitudes. And some have labeled this a sermon of opposites, right? What the world thinks is happiness versus what Jesus says is a source of happiness. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. Boy, that sounds like fun. To be persecuted. To be one who mourns. To be one who is meek. Right? I'm speaking of the world's context and definitions of these things. But the Beatitudes are more than just the fact of saying these are the blessed people. This is Jesus' worldview here, which is very different from what others outside of the Christian life would view as something that is happy or blessed. He's showing us how to really live in a very crazy a challenging world. You can clearly see that it's not our worldview. So we have to step out of that worldview of our own today and get into God's. So a beatitude. What is the beatitude? As I mentioned earlier, one dictionary didn't even have it in there. Okay, I did find it in another, and it said, "I like this, a state of utmost bliss." That's that's a place I want to be. That's a condition I want to know more about and look into. How can I get there? It's not just superficial and something I would last, I hope. And another uh, definition said, any of the statements referred to in the Sermon on the Mount, a very safe uh, way to describe it, right? My study Bible declared it as declarations of blessings, okay? which is fitting as well. But blessings, blessed, we throw that word around a lot, very casual, maybe too many times. What is it to be blessed, right? We say, bless you. We say, oh, you are blessed. I remember I just mentioned that to Mary Jane the other day. We were talking about grandkids of hers, right? I said, you're blessed. And she agreed. And that is, those are blessings. But to be blessed in the context of these Beatitudes, we're going to study them a little bit more. Because these are, these are some difficult concepts to grasp and, and to really seek after in this day and age. Blessed, approved by God. I like how that is said. Max Lucado said it as the applause of heaven. Amen. That's what we ought to be seeking after. That's a type of blessing I wanted to know. So Matthew 5 is, is not the only place you're going to find a lot of blessings. From beginning to end, this great book, this God-inspired word of truth is all about a lot of blessings. Psalm chapter 1, very first psalm. You'll find a lot of blessings in Psalms and Proverbs, right? A little bit in Isaiah and even Jeremiah, I believe. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Here, this word blessed is really talking about the happy condition of really those who, who revere the Lord, right? Who walk in his ways. And you'll find it repeatedly there. Even in the preparation of the end times in Revelation. Did you know Revelation has Beatitudes? It's kind of a sad looking outlook, you know, to look toward that's challenges 
the difficulty that it is to get into the kingdom to know things in the end times, the gloom and doom that we might say there. Revelation uh, 1 and 3, very beginning of Revelation. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Again, the first of about seven Beatitudes that I found in Revelation. Here, blessed means much more than just happy, my friends. It really describes the favorable circumstances that God's put you in. And how did he say you'll find that blessing? By getting into the word, by following it, putting in your heart. Uh, the very last chapter of Revelation, the very closing thoughts. These are Jesus' own words that are quoted here in 22 verse 7 of Revelation. Behold, I am coming. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. A beatitude to close out the end times. Hold on to it. Let's go through these beatitudes because I know there's a lot of confusion many times in the world about what, uh, what we're seeking in, in a biblical worldview of beatitudes. So... Verse three, the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. Why would I want to be poor, right? But don't separate this fact that it says poor in spirit. It's not a don't misunderstand this fact that God is he's not condemning wealth here. You don't have to be poor, nor is he esteeming you to be poor. It has nothing to do with your bank account, really. It's Jesus speaking about those who esteem themselves as they really are before God. Lost, hopeless, empty. We truly are. Aren't we empty, hopeless? To be poor in spirit means to acknowledge your spiritual bankruptcy. To acknowledge you are in need of God. Isaiah 66 2 says it this way. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit. And who trembles at my word. It's from the prophet Isaiah. So blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is something that's not earned. It's a gift. Being poor in spirit. Being so broken. Knowing your position in relationship to God. It's what gets us there. Okay, that's the fourth blessing. What about the second blessing? Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Mourning again is really about brokenheartedness, right? It's okay and it's good to mourn. It's good to mourn those we've lost, right? It means we know what love is. But it also acknowledges the fact that we can't do anything about it. And we have to lay ourselves before God to heal that mourning. Mourning allows us to express um, a lot of things. It gives us a perspective of brevity in life, right? The fact that life is a vapor is so good. But amen, the fact that we will be comforted, the scripture says. The third one, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now here's one that as a man I might struggle with, right? Meekness. Not weak. Don't confuse the fact that this would say weak, because none of us desire to be weak. Meekness is really a state of, of humility before God, right? realizing that he is the source of all of our strength, all our power. It's about surrendering and about obedience. Right? I think about meekness a lot of times as kind of a, a submissiveness, giving up your power. I think about it in relation to horses, right? How, we measure power and strength in horsepower, right? But a horse can be meek. We can train. Think of two different arenas. Think about riding a horse for pleasure versus riding a horse in the rodeo arena. I've tried riding in both. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier when they are submissive, right? When they are meek, when we have been trained and disciplined versus when it's coming out of the bucket shoe, flanked up, you realize the power that we um, uh, could, could hold, right? If we are, are let loose, if we are unreined, unbridled. Philippians 4, uh, no, excuse me, Philippians 2, 3 is one I like uh, a lot of times about meekness. 
It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Did I really write that note correctly? I did. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst. You ever been hungry? Yeah, we all get hungry, right? Thirsty? When you are hungry and thirsty, truly hungry and thirsty, it consumes you, right? You'll do everything in your power to get to Casey's, right? <laughs> to... To wake up in the morning. It's the first thing on my mind, right? So you got to have coffee to get going. A lot of times if I haven't had, for some reason, we ran out of milk, my day is not going to go well. All right? I experienced that once when I lived in Denmark. The the family I worked for lived with, the the girls consumed all the milk that morning. And, whew, yeah, they heard about it. I apologize. But anyway, it consumes you, Right? So those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, do everything you can to satisfy your thirst. If you're in the desert, what do we see on the films? They make a mirage, right? I mean, that's you're so dry, you're so thirsty. We're talking about seeking the Lord, seeking the righteousness, seek what he desires with all our heart, being singular, focused on that. And we'll be filled, we'll be satisfied. The food in the world will never fill you up, right? When we structure our day around our meals, we think it's that important. And yes, I'm saying we don't have to have nourishment every time. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The merciful. We have all been apportioned a certain amount of grace, the Bible says. And we're to extend that grace to others. The merciful, those who acknowledge some of that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Pure heart, those, again, who are truly uh, seeking righteousness, those who are singular focused. John 14, 23 says, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will what? Obey my teachings. He will come and I and we will come to him. We meaning the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, right? And we will make our home in him. Those who are pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. There's a rarity in this world today, right? A peacemaker? We all want to argue and get our own way. We all listen to the politicians bickering back and forth, right? We all find hostility everywhere we turn, even in our best relationships. If I were to say that Don never argued with me, I'd be lying, right? Even in our marriages, we have differences we are full of peace but we are called to be peacemakers here that we will have a reward we will be called sons of god blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness persecution who wants to be persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven verse 10 says i think about persecution you don't have to look very far throughout jesus's ministry right he was persecuted because why Really, because people are jealous, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, every sect that was trying to abide by the law didn't want to admit that something greater than them, greater than their legalistic ways was here and right in front of them. They sought out, they persecuted him. Far more to the extent than what you and I will ever encounter, right? We take it so subtly. We are called to be persecuted sometimes. Not just intentionally, but because we're doing the right things. Being righteous, as the word said. I think a lot of times about Paul. Um, let's read, take one excerpt from, from Paul's testimonies. I love it. When I teach, uh, when I work with the teens, I just love going through the life of Paul and demonstrating what your testimonies are. Would look like right what your story of life is and in, in philippians 4 11 through 13 read this this is paul i am not saying this because i am in need i have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances that's the challenge with the world's thought of happiness it's all circumstantial right but paul said that i know what it is to be in need we don't know that in this country 
And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then the infamous verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? Always remember here that God can guide you through any difficult situation. Persecutions, difficulties, challenges. When you're at your lowest, he'll pull you through. And James, the very brother of Jesus, also put it well in his opening letter. Um, I need to have more tabs. James uh, 1. James chapter 1 to uh, consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You've been there because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Right? You should pray. You ever thought about praying the Beatitudes? Pray through the Beatitudes, seeking those blessings. He who gives generously to all without finding fault, it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. When you pray, when you ask of these things, pray in faith. Believe that it's going to happen. Right? Otherwise, it's not all it might be cracked up to be. Verse 11, we'll finish this beatitude so we can get on to the meat of what God really wants us to take away from this as, as a Christian and, and get outside these walls of the church. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, if you don't have the saving in your heart, I'm speaking a lot of foreign concept to you. I understand that. But it says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way... They persecuted the prophets who were before you. And I gave you a few examples um, of what that uh, looks like. So, yes, we can be blessed. We can endure the things that God calls us to be that the world don't think that, that they would enjoy, right? That we wouldn't necessarily enjoy, but we're to go through them. And after we go through them, here's what we are to do. We are to be the salt and light of the world. Verses 13 through 16. Jesus says this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify or praise your Father in heaven. Right? This is about letting your light shine and letting your light shine by doing and not for doing. Okay? Infamous verses. There's even songs about it, right? I, can, I know exactly that little Sunday school classroom I was in when we learned and sang that song. Hide it under a bushel? No. Right? Blow it out? No. Very, very touching. But what does it mean for us? What is today's takeaway in the fact of how are we to be salty and how are we to be enlightening in the world? Very, very important concepts uh, to grasp. There's a, there's a song out right now on country radio, and I think that there's playing on Christian radio too probably, right? But it's called... Um, uh, in a world, I don't know what the title of it is, but in a world full of hate, be a light. In a world full of hate, be a light. And that's the world we find ourselves in. I think especially in these times of some of this political uh, context that we've been in in the last several months and, and continue to endure. In a world full of dark, darkness, we are uh, to be the light here. Um, we are those who have come from darkness and into light. And we are to reflect the light we have found where? Only in Jesus. That's the only light that exists in the world outside of what's been man-made, right? And these can go out anytime. Jesus points here to the fact that we aren't 
to also shine it in our own little circles, right? Just at our dinner table when we pray, just in the church, we are called to take it out of here. In the very end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, it talks about the Great Commission, right? God's last words in that. He says, what? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go. Tell them about me. Tell them about the good news. The only great news, the greatest news that exists in this world. Thousands of years ago and today and tomorrow as well, that is the good news. And we're to be the salt. We're to be the light that takes it there. Salt is something that had great value in the day. And it does to us today. I mean, my kids are always saying, this ain't salt, right? Why? Because it flavors things. But the other thing it does is it preserves things. That's what they used it for mainly in that day was meat, right? We didn't have refrigeration. We had to salt things up. And to lose its saltiness, let me give you a little background on that, is today's table salt that we use, or iodized salt, it really doesn't lose its saltiness, Okay. So that concept may be hard to understand unless you get it wet or something. It's not very good. But saltiness, the salt that they had in that region referred to that to come from the Dead Sea, which is like 35 percent salt. I mean, just ungodly amount. But it's very impure. It's not just straight sodium chloride. Right. It's got some other minerals in it, potassiums and who knows what that that the. Elements of the earth degrade it. Sunlight, getting soil in it, moisture, they degrade it. So it loses its, it can lose its saltiness, loses its effectiveness. I don't know about you, but that's not something I once said about me, being unsalty, losing my effectiveness, right? So salt had and does have great value. They even use it as a trading currency. Okay, it had, had tremendous value. So the importance here of talking about saltiness or savoriness or flavoring is talking about our impact to people. I think that's very, very important. And I, I know I forget it many times in everyday conversations and everyday needs you see in the world. We forget that we're to be that salt. We're to be that impact here because of all the beatitudes we have. Wouldn't it be great if others know them as well? You are Savior. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. What's it mean to be a light? What does it mean to shine um, out into our very, very dark world? Ephesians 5, verse 8 says this way. Be imitate, no, verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You've been saved. You know that. You've been saved. Giving your life to Jesus. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of what? All goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Verse 13, be everything, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. There's a lot of darkness out there. There's a lot of people hurting. If the light's not shown into their life and shown into their heart, it's not going to come out. We can go to the grave still being dark, still being hurt. For it is light that makes everything visible. Paul urges us a lot of times to really live a life worthy of the calling that we received. And we're to put on a, a new self. Here into what uh, this context of living as children of light is referring to. Changing our way of thinking. Changing our way of of acting. And I don't necessarily mean taking that million lumen incandescent light bulb and just blasting it in people's face either, right? That's not necessarily the way Jesus did it. It's not the way we're to do it. Understand where they're at. Meet them where they are. There's so many great things to be Gained by being a salt and being a light in the world. There's a lot of places that we can really shine the glorious light and the good news of the world, of the gospel, right? The daily walk with your family, with your co-workers, with your clients that you interact with, right? Your neighborhood and your community, your church, your social network, whether that's virtual or in person, right? We're to be a salt. And I know... 
There's a lot of unsaltiness and a lot of other garbage out there on that virtual networking, right? We have to filter that out. God bless you if you watch the news very often these days, right? Believing in impact. Be a salt. Be a light. Be an impact. A taste of Jesus. One of the things that um, when I used to be on campus at Iowa State University all the time and, and interact with a lot of international students, the salt and light is something that really speaks to me because you had the best and brightest minds, I'm speaking of Asian students a lot of times, that would come to you and, and for some, I was gathered in some ministries um, that, that, that they would come to you, or you'd just be interacting with them just in some graduate work and some projects and research, and they would say, why are you so happy? You know, what, what's, what's the source of your happiness? And really what they're asking about is what's the source of your joy, right? What's different about you? Because as I said, these are some of the brightest minds some, uh, some brilliant, brilliant students who come from sometimes very wealthy families to get them here. But they're missing something. In, in all of the seeking their education, <clears throat> seeking success in whatever field it is, they realize that there's something empty and there's something different about someone who's truly following Jesus. And it was, it was great because you said, well, I'm glad you asked, right? Let me show you, let me tell you about a love, about a peace that passes all understanding. That's really what they wanted. Peace and a joy. And, but to overcome that mental roadblock, yeah, it was often a challenge, but, but what a joy it was uh, so many times. Why are you happy? Why are you joyous? They wanted to know peace, comfort, joy, and the happiness. Again, that peace passes all understanding. They were empty. So I want to kind of wrap this up a little bit. We've got uh, more of, the, of chapter 5 to cover, but I'm not going to spend much time in there. Jesus goes on to talk about the fact that he is the fulfillment of the law here. And uh, he, he, again, talk about a sermon of opposites. He, he, he talks a lot about the fact that I'm not here to really abolish the old law. Those are still great things that, that the Old Testament law talks about in the first five chapters of the Bible. And then even the prophets, adding more onto that in the rest of the Old Testament. But he gets a lot more specific about that relationship of the law. In contrasting kind of Jesus' teaching here with many common interpretations of the law, he says, you've heard it said, but here's what I say, right? You've heard it this way, I tell you. Jesus reveals a true intent here in the law rather than a lot of legalistic interpretations. He speaks of... Uh, my Bible labels it anger, divorce, oaths, retaliation. We're all doing that. Love for our enemies. So we do notice a lot of stark contrast to our own culture's thoughts on this, right? Our culture says it's okay to be angry and it's okay to lust. Really? Our divorce rates are over 60% in this world? Yeah, it's okay, right? We retaliate when people do mean things to us. We don't love our enemies as we should. We, we give out a lot of empty promises every day. And here Jesus speaks to those. Our culture tells us really to, to hate our enemies. You don't have to look very far between Republicans and Democrats left and right to notice that at the very moment, do you? Jesus is imploring us to live, though, a very drastically different life from the culture we live in. We're called to let our light shine and live as if the world literally depends on the fact that it's our life that's going to preserve it. We all want to see this land saved and healed, right? The Bible says that happy are the feet of those who bring good news. Bring the good news. Go forth with it from here today and uh, just uh, carry it. Always remember it. Be blessed today to realize that the real truth, the lasting definition of blessedness is not circumstantial in context of the world. It's all about God. It's a circumstance that's it's already been done, right? Circumstance has been paid. The only circumstance is now on us that you make that decision to follow Jesus. I know there's probably some in here today that maybe don't know the Lord. They don't realize that. But there is a man, there's a God that made himself a man that came to minister to us. The demonstrated love and sacrifice. Great and wonderful 
teachings, not just good stuff, but eternal stuff that matters. He put his one and only son on an old rugged cross to die for us. Right? That's something we have to acknowledge. You have to accept that today. He bled for us and died for you and I. It's not circumstantial, nor is it controversial. That's love and it's obligation. Circumstance on us, will we accept him? I'll invite the band up to uh, give us a song of invitation. And I want you to think about that if you're a seeker. Do I know the Lord? What can he do for me? He can do things beyond measure. If you're not comfortable with that thought today, visit with me later. I'd be glad to, to share some more about what can come from accepting Jesus and what you, when you come to him and admit our iniquities, our brokenness, our emptiness, let him fill you up. Let him take over your life. Believe me, we're no good at running our own life. We seek after all those wrong things we talked about, right? Money, the things that we can't buy, the success that we will never, ever achieve to fill us up. Riches never keep ceasing. You never reach what you're after in those. The hidden secrets and shames that that we have a lot of times, they've already been borne by him, him alone. So Christian as well, have you lacked that sense of peace? Have you struggled with these things of recognizing what blessings can come from you? I said, you just examine that in your heart today and, uh, and bring it to God. How can he build you up? How can he help you be a salt and light, even though we want to be meek or called to be meek? His ways.